a warm welcome to all our attendees uh, to for today's Science Circle uh, Lecture on Science Communication. I see that a lot of people are joining at the moment and a warm welcome to our speaker, Rebecca Winkles, who is connected from uh, Berlin uh, uh, to, um, with us today. My name is uh, Katja Lasch. I am the director of the German Center for Research and Innovation. And uh, yeah, we are having our second Science Circle Lecture of this year's uh, uh, where we will focus on science uh, communication. One might ask, if you look at our normal program, why the German Center for Research and Innovation is dealing with science communication. We are connecting the German and Indian research system, but we are also a platform for thematic exchange and not just for uh, science and uh, humanities. We provide also information and advice on the research landscape. And one of our pillars is also to look into current policy developments and trends and into general discourse on uh, science policies in India and Germany. And that's why we are dealing also with science communication. If you would have asked maybe 20 years ago, researchers they would have said, we don't need science communication. Good science stands for themselves. But we have seen over the last couple of years a tremendous shift of the topic, uh, as well as in Germany as in India. Nowadays, the European Union requests for funding and all the projects have a dissemination plan in place. Uh, we have dedicated forums and associations dealing with, with science communication, but we also have policy level uh, dealing with science communication. And 2019, the German Ministry of Research published a policy paper for science communication and uh, in 2020-21, they have run a large stakeholder dialogue uh, resulting in a paper where we have a couple of guidelines in place now for Germany, a factory viscom is the name of the paper. But also on the Indian side, if one has a look in the new science and technology policy draft, their science communication is highlighted. And also in a lot of papers, uh, you find science communication in India and, uh, who are dealing with social responsible research. And we have in both countries long lasting structures actually in place. Science museums uh, is a strength of well as the Indian as the German system. And for Indian, the Indian side, we have, for instance, the National Center for Science Communicators. And I'm very glad for today's Science Circle lecture that we have one of the nodal agencies uh, in Wissenschaft im Dialog, which is placed in Berlin. She holds a bachelor degree in biology from Kiel University and a master's degree in science journalism uh, from the City University of London. And before joining Wissenschaft im Dialog, she worked for the Helmholtz Association, one of the renowned uh, German research associations in various roles with the public relations sector. We intend this session to be today an interactive session. So after the presentation by Rebecca, I would like to invite you all to post your questions, your comments in the chat. We will take them up in the discussions afterwards. So without further ado and without further consuming time, Rebecca, the floor is yours. And I'm really looking forward yeah, to your presentation on the good, the bad and the future of science communication. Over to you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome. I'm going to share my screen quickly and hopefully it will work because it did work earlier, so it should work now as well. Um, you can see my screen, I assume. Uh, um, I'm going to talk to you about some current developments. I'm going to talk to you about uh, what is happening and what should be happening in science communication going forward. First of all, though, I would like to address the point why we have to talk about science communication and why science communication currently is one of the things that concerns a lot of people throughout the world. There are quite obvious reasons. Um, depicted here in the pictures are obviously some things going on about climate change. We have a ongoing pandemic that still isn't open over, even though we were all hoping for it to be over by now. And we have other issues like genome engineering and the fear of creating designer babies, um, which are all things related to science that concern our societies and the way we want to live in the future. So they, these are pretty obvious reasons. Um, to put them into a bit of perspective. I think the main reasons why we need to talk about science communication are that research by now runs through many of the challenges of our, mod our modern societies are facing. So the three examples I mentioned are only a few of the things where science plays a role in the way we live today. Um, research at the same time is becoming, becoming more and more complex and harder to understand as a lay person. So that basically means that even though research is more important for our daily lives, we have trouble to understand the details of research and much more so than it used to be the case. Um, so um, lay people need a way to make decisions for their private lives, for their political lives and for everything else basically 
based on informed trust, because there's no way of understanding all the details underlying science. Um, and, and that's another th reason why we need to talk about SciComm, is the political interest and also maybe pressure in science and in science communication has arisen. So um, all those things mean that science communication is becoming more and more important. And also, of course, we need to talk about science communication because people do not trust science anymore, but do they? And by asking that question, it gives off the suggestion that they actually do and there's something wrong about the myth. Because if we look at data, and this is um, representative data from the science barometer that we at Wissenschaft and Dialog are conducting yearly um, in, into how much people trust in science and research, we can actually see that during the pandemic, trust in science has increased. And there's roughly 61%, around 60% who are trusting completely or somewhat in science. That's quite a high number, and it doesn't really reflect what we're seeing or experiencing on the streets. And it doesn't really give any notion to the myth that science is not trusted by people and that people are skeptical at science. It's not only true in Germany. Here's some data, some worldwide data from the Wellcome Trust that actually shows that scientists are really highly trusted. So um, what they did is they took the percentage who trust each institution or group a lot, and that's depicted here. So we can see that so trust in science is, is much higher than, for example, in journalists or in politicians. So that's a good sign, sign for science, and that should mean that everything is fine. And we could actually stop talking about science communication right now. Hearing that we have an hour to discuss, you might be aware of the fact that I'm not going to uh, stop talking now and not going to suggest that everything is just fine. It is not. Um, we have seen in the during the pandemic, but much earlier than that, actually, that there are huge problems within science and within science communication and within the relationship between science and the public. We've seen demonstrations about COVID measurements. We are seeing people calling global warming a huge fraud. Um, and we're also seeing that attacks on science during the COVID pandemic and attacks on individual scientists who were outspoken have increased. So unfortunately, even though trust in science is high and higher than we very often assume, it is still not the case that everything is fine and we can ignore those skeptics. Um, but what's ha what has changed? So what has happened in the last year and why? It doesn't, as uh, Katja pointed out earlier, science or good science stand on its own anymore. Um, quite frankly, the world has pretty much changed. If we then go a bit away from the broad picture and go into the media system, we see that a lot has changed in our media system. Back in the day, we had research on one side, we had the media in the middle, and we had the public on the other side. The media, would hear about research, would read about research, would then take that research and explain to the public what that research A means, how they can understand it, and then thirdly, what they can and should do with the research. So that was a very simple test uh, system, very one directional, easy to control. The media had the power of building the framing and the narrative. Through digitalization, which is the main game changer in any information system, and not only, of course, in science communication. So all this, what I'm saying now, is true for any other um, area or field that has anything to do with uh, communications or information uptake. Um, so what changed now is that today we have a direct connection between the public and research. So researchers can actively communicate with the public and the public has the opportunity to question research itself and also to read and find out about niche experiences. So that whole thing, which is now just symbolized by that one red arrow, doesn't look like much of a change, but it means and has a lot of implications going forward. Um, so what does it actually mean? 
It means more director and faster communication. Mm. I would like to address the point that that isn't always bad. So not everything about that change is bad because more director and faster communication also allows us to gain information that we were excluded from before. And it also allows us to raise global awareness for issues, for issues like climate change, for issues like gender diversity, for issues um, like Black Lives Matter. So those movements would not be possible on a global level and on a global stage without this change in the media system. However, the destruction of the sender receiver model, so the very simple science and research sends out something, the public uptakes the information through an intermediate, and the destruction of that model has put our media system under pressure and it has left our society with the issue that individual people now have to judge the information and have to decide whether it's true, whether it's fake, and has to be a lot, and there's a lot more to do for the general public than there used to be. It also means that there's no such thing as a general public anymore. So we have a very fragmented society these days when we look at news consumption. So there's people who only use social media as a news source, there's people who only watch TV, and then there's people who only read papers. And also within those news outlets, we see that there's different outlets um, used by different people. So it's not possible anymore to inform the public by using one source, which used to be possible because everyone would watch the eight o'clock news. Yeah? So that means a massive change. And at the same time, while dealing with the fact that we have to judge what, what certain information is worth, we have so much more information that we are seeing something that, the, um, that some people call an infodemic. So we have so much information that, we're, that we have an overload of it and it makes it really, really difficult for individual people to sort through the news that they're getting on a daily, um, in a daily amount. So the results for SICOM of that development, um, which is a general media development, is new goals and a new environment. So we had to rethink the way we do science communication and we had to rethink the way in which um, in which environment we do it and which media outlets we can use. What we've been really, really good at, and I've said that or promised that I would talk about good things as well, is at preaching to the choir. We have in the past 20 years or roughly 20 years, at least in Germany and, and a bit, bit earlier and some other countries a bit later in others, um, we have managed to build formats over formats for science communication. We've been really, really good at developing new ways of communicating science. But we're currently preaching to the choir. So that's what we can do. The problem is that we need to reach the unknown and the undecided. So we need to reach people who do not necessarily trust science or who have, and that's even more important, no direct relation to science. Trust might be high, but there's still a very loud minority of people that is skeptical towards science. And about 20%, at least in Germany, are undecided if they trust science or not. And that number is too high. And we need to figure out how to reach those people who are undecided. It's not necessarily the skeptics we need to reach, because that is very difficult to change a mind there. And also they are a minority. But reaching those 20% that can't make up their minds if they trust science or not, that's the people we really, really need to reach. So what do we know about them? We know about them, and that is true for most countries and not only Germany. There have been similar studies in other countries as well. Um, we know that income and the level of education matter for them. So the higher the income and the higher the level of education, the more people trust in science and in science. Um, age is a factor for both trust and conspiracy myth. So the younger the people are, the more they trust, but also the younger the people are, the more 
that they believe in conspiracy myth. There are a few suggestions on why that is happening. The one I'm prone to believe is that conspiracy myths have a lot to do with, uh, with experience knowledge. So with what have I known and how much knowledge have I gathered about the world in the time I've been alive? And younger people don't have as much experience knowledge to compare things to. So that, so that could relate use to conspiracy myths at that stage. Um, political views matter, and that is important to keep in mind. The people that identify with right-wing parties trust less in science and in any other form of elite system, to be fair. Um, and media consumption matters. The more social media people use as a main news source, not as an additional news source or as an entertainment medium or anything like that, because that's also reasons you could use social media, the less they trust in science. Um, all those things are really, really, really important to know because we cannot lose 20% of the German population for science. We cannot risk not addressing those people and getting them on board. Yeah? And when I'm talking about getting them on board, I always mean informed trust. I don't want anyone to follow science blindly. So, but how do we do it? It doesn't seem to be an easy thing because I've already mentioned that what we're really, really good at is addressing those people that already love science. We've built formats for them. We know a lot about them. We know how to address them because they are close to the people, close to the way we live. Um, what we know about those, about the way to reach those who maybe don't have a connection to science is that we need to listen to them. So that sounds like a very basic thing, but it's very, very, very hard and very difficult to closely listen to the issues people have with something you believe as strongly in as the job you're doing as a scientist. So listening about issues, listening about the reasons they don't trust, listening to their fears is a very important thing. We need to do, reduce the distance. And by reducing the distance, I mean things like not having our events and our science communication um, formats happening in universities all the time. We need to go where the people are. We need to find ways to engage with them in areas that they feel conf confident in. Because a university building can be a huge barrier when you've never been in one yourself. Um, we need to make connections to everyday life and show why it is important to know about science and why it is important to engage with it. And um, we need to go where the people are. So I said something about reducing the distance, but I also um, mean not only the physical distance, but also the distance of formats we use to our communication. Um, we need to stop thinking that everyone should read the papers we read. We need to find ways to engage in areas where the people actually are already going for news. And yes, that does mean we need to use social media and find a way to engage with audiences there. And unfortunately, and that is a sad, sad truth, it is very hard to achieve this. And thus, it's a long-term task. It won't be done today, it won't be done tomorrow. But we have to keep doing it because otherwise we are losing a lot of people for science and for science communication. Um, so with all those problems outlined and the one very small bit we are really, really good at in science communication these days, I would like to um, see some changes in the future. And it's obviously not only me who wants to see those futures, but this is the discussion and where it is going currently. Um, we do need more process oriented communication. If you want to build informed trust, and that should be our goal, it is not enough to spread knowledge. We, for a very long time, believed that the more people know about science or a scientific issue, the more they will trust. But it's not about that. Trust is created by talking and understanding the methods, processes and values of science much more than talking about the results. I think we've all seen that during the COVID pandemic, that it is crucial that people understand how science works to understand that 
scientific evidence can change, that science is developing over time, and that results that we once believed were true have, have falsified. So being transparent about those things and making sure people understand the workings and the underlying concepts of science is much more important than increasing knowledge about individual scientific results. And we really need to start doing that more. And therefore, we need to see the development which, which we have been seeing from information to dialogue to participation to conclude in dialogue and participation about methods, processes, values of science. And we need to stop to pretend that there are no uncertainties in science we, and no mistakes. We need to be more, um, more transparent about those. We also need researchers to become the center of attention. Researchers have become the center of, of science communication during the pandemic. And the simple reason is that they are authentic ambassadors of science. So if it is about creating trust, scientists and researchers from different fields and areas are the people who need to talk about science and who need to show what they're doing because only they can achieve that honestly. I, as a science communicator, can offer stages, can build rooms for engagement, but I can't talk about the deeper and underlining values of science as well as a scientist can. However, um, by pushing researchers into the center of science communication, we need to make room for that because we've seen now that researchers need to do one more thing. So they already have a lot of work and a lot of things to do, but now we expect them to do this thing as well, communicate. So what needs to change is we need to build up competences, but we also, and that is much more important, is we need to build up acceptance for science communication within research and enable those who want to communicate to actually be able to do it without losing out on their research career. And and that is very important because we've seen how nasty things can get during the pandemic, but climate change researchers will tell you it started much earlier. We need to help scientists when help is needed. And that means that we have to develop measures to actually support them psychological, but also when it comes to dealing with, uh, with the law. Um, we need more evidence-based science communication. We know too little about what we're doing. So strengthening the science of science communication and its transfer to practical science communication is crucial if we want to fight conspiracy myths, if we want to develop communication strategies that are actually target group orientated, and if we want to raise the overall quality of science communication. So we need to enable scientists to communicate based on the knowledge we as communication researchers, for example, have gained through our experiences and through the research we're doing to equip them with the methods. We know a lot about how to fight conspiracy myths, but we're not using that in practice yet. Um, we need to clarify our roles with scientists becoming more prominent in communication. We need to discuss and have a really open-minded discussion, discussion about what their role in our society is. And we need to make those roles transparent. So one question, of, of course, is how should they relate to politics? And how should science and politics interfere with each other? These are just some random newspaper headlines on what those roles could be. But we also went on to ask in that science barometer what the role should be if we ask in the society. And they all, or 50% of people said, scientists should recommend certain policy decisions to politicians based on science evidence. So that would actually mean interacting in a quite prominent role with science. But there's also good arguments to be made for them only providing the evidence and then letting politicians make the decision. So this is a really interesting and really important thing we need to figure out in the next uh, few years. Because of course, the, uh, the interest has increased on science and, uh, and the political pressure is on. 
So we now have to make sure that we get our roles right and don't do everything for politicians. Um, we also, and that is a very crucial thing, and that is a bit outside of the scope of science communication only, need to, we need to fix our debate culture. We need to stop screaming in public debates, quite literally. This is happening online, but to be fair, it's happening offline as well. So when we do talk shows, we always have two opposite poles on those talk shows screaming at each other. What we would need is them actually discussing the gray areas between those poles. And we need to make this, this, those discussions meaningful again. Um, with that, we need to fix the problem with fake news and misinformation, even in our debate. And for that, I think we need a multi-level approach. I think there's no one answer to uh, fighting fake news. We need education. We need help with it. We need to build trust long term. And yes, we do need fact checking, but fact checking cannot, as it is very often done, only happen on sides that no one who actually doesn't trust science comes across. And of course we need, or maybe we don't, um, a regulation of social networks. I, for a very long time, believed that the system should fix itself. I think now we've, or most people have come to realize that there needs to be some way to regulate those networks because they are just too fast and we're just seeing too much development in the area and we're seeing that it doesn't self-regulate itself. So we need to think about how we would have regulate social me media networks. And I mean, we do regulate the way we talk to each other on the street in a way, so it shouldn't be too far-fetched actually. Um, all in all, I think we need a new type of science communication to solve all those problems because the problems are massive. Um, I've only depicted four of the things that I think this new type of psychom should be. We could add to that, I'm pretty sure we can, but um, for me, those four are the most crucial points. Science communication should focus less on the reputation of institutions and more on achieving something for the common good. I think this is pivotal to actually changing our culture and talking about science. I really, really don't think we need a, an, another image film on how great a certain university is. We need to sort out the bigger issues and we need to do that together. And we need the research organizations to do that with us. They are very important to actually make that change happen. Science can, communication needs to take the public more serious and it needs to listen carefully to understand different perspectives. We very often tend to think that we are right and so people should just believe us and trust us because we're doing a good job. I think there's a good argument that that is a bit too much and that we think too highly of ourselves and we don't reflect on why we're not reaching people enough. And so I think taking the public serious and don't pretending that they are stupid just because they lack expert knowledge is a crucial thing that has to change in science communication. Science communication should be evidence-based and hold itself to a higher standard. I think it is crucial that we develop guidelines and we have some guidelines in places in a lot of places around the world, but we need to stick to those guidelines. We know what good science communication is, but we're very often losing it for reputation or orientated communication or for our own good or our own career fostering moments. So we need to stop that and we need to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And that is both researchers communicating as well as politicians communicating about science, journalists communicating about science and science communicators communicating about science. And science communication needs to make sure it reflects the diversity of science. I don't, I don't think there's a good argument to be made that one science should be more present than another. And that there's a lot of, a lot of the issues we are facing today are based on different perspectives from science and depicting that difference and that those multiple uh, perspectives on issues is very, very important. We've seen that during the COVID pandemic. In the beginning, it was virologists talking and explaining the pandemic to us. 
And then some social scientists came in, were like, hang on, maybe it's not a good idea for mental health to lock everyone away for multiple weeks. So this difference and that balance and finding that balance is crucial. But to achieve that balance, we need to depict the diversity of science and the diversity of the different scientific perspectives. And I think that's why there's a good argument from my side for saying that scientists and researchers should present their knowledge and should present evidence to politicians. But the decision making and the balancing act, which way to go, is a politician's job because they've been elected contrary to scientists who are funded by the public and who have a responsibility to pro provide evidence. But they're not elected to make decisions. To achieve all that and to achieve a new way of science communication, and these are my, in a nutshell, summary before we open the floor for questions, is that we need to gain a better understanding about the impact our science communication efforts have. We need to reach those that we are currently not reaching. We need to communicate the methods, processes and values of research and not just the results. We need to encourage, support and enable researchers who want to communicate. We need to clarify the relationship between research and politics, and we need a debate on public debates. And thereby, I will close this presentation. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm hoping that those are some talking points that we can pick up uh, now going forward. Yes, thanks, Rebecca, so much for your presentation and your thoughts. I think there's a lot of food for thought in that, so it was quite comprehensive. Um, so uh, we'd like to invite uh, uh, our attendees, please post in the chat your comments, your thoughts on the presentation and also your questions you would like to address. Um, but maybe I kick it off with, with two questions. Uh, I was a bit uh, surprised that you were putting such a focus in your presentation at once like, yes, we need the use of social media. My understanding would be, but I'm for a long time in marketing uh, of higher education and research that social media is a must have these days. Is there still a question about this? Because I'm, it was, was striking to me a bit that you were um, uh, highlighting this one specific point. Um, um, so is there in Germany still hesitance about it to use it for science communication? Yeah, I think so. Surprisingly, it's surprising to me every now and then. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I've, I've, very much during the pandemic as well, I've heard people or scientists say that they don't want to use social media anymore because it's too stressful, because it's too nasty, because discussions aren't fruitful. But I think there's, I think that's almost goes into the same thing that I said about a slight arrogance we have about things in science every now and then is that I feel if we keep out of the social media landscape completely, we just lose people for science and we can't afford that even as scientists and so that's why i think it's such an important point and we very often hear in germany when we give seminars and things like that we hear oh yeah but like is is there really good science communication happening on instagram or twitter is that really really good or is that serious enough and i think that's just an to me that's a ridiculous point and and almost a bit of a dangerous point if we wouldn't want to go that far. Okay, uh, my second question was, so you were talking about, there was actually a question I had before, who's the better science communicator? No, you said we need scientists, but yourself, you have a master's degree in uh, in, in, in science communication in a, in a field. And I see uprising in Germany, a lot of these master's degrees for science communication, also in India, we have an institute in, in, in place. So how we get these two points uh, together um, to have a professional science communication, which is needed today and also have these participative structures in. So who's the better science uh, communicator or what would be a working way? I think, I think the way I like to look at it is I would like to define the role of professional science communicators like myself as people who open rooms, who provide knowledge on the mechanisms of communication, um, rather than being the ones who actually explain the science and leave that explanation and that not only result oriented explanation, as I said, but leave that part to the scientists, but help them with it through providing knowledge, through opening doors, through creating spaces for that exchange. 
I think that used to be different. I think 10 years ago, I would have said the opposite. <laughs> but I think this is what we're seeing now. And this is what we're seeing as becoming more and more important as science is getting a bit complicated as well. Yeah, I have here a question in from uh, Chiranjivi Adhikari and asking who are the basic, I think it goes in that direction, who are the basic foundational disciplines of science communication? If we take especially health communication. So what, what foundation one should have to have a good, to be able to good science communication, let's say in, 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 uh, in, in public health, for instance, or about health? Yeah, I think it's, I think that's, I hope I made that point. I think it is a bit more about, um, what knowledge can you add to the issue? I think it's not so much about you need to be from one discipline to be a good science communicator. I think it's more about what side of the argument and what side of the story am I on as a communicator and where do I, where do my strengths lie? So yeah, I think there's no one disciplinary that discipline that is important for science communication. I think is there's hugely beneficial psychological research on trust in science, for example. And then again, there's uh, biologists who do brilliant science communication. So I don't think there's a one discipline that makes you a good science communicator, really. Good. Uh, we have a question which is go more on a policy level from from Weibov Agarwal is asking one has seen in the pandemics that politics uh, it's not easy to separate politics from science and science communication. So how one can reduce the influence of politics and science and maybe in this specific context can science communication help to reduce the influence because you've talked a lot of this bottom-up approach that science communication should facilitate um, uh, not for evidence-based uh, policy but it's also the opposite way down so can science communication help to reduce the influence of politics in science yeah, maybe in a, in a more indirect way. I think I think we can help scientists deal with the political system because we have, or as science communicators, we should have the knowledge about the political system and what it wants from science. And if we prepare scientists better for that dialogue, we would go a long way. I think during the pandemic, the pressure was so high sometimes, there was no time for reflection if we would have done more work on that reflection part before that would have been beneficial during the pandemic and then we were learning on the job which sometimes is good but maybe not if it's a public health crisis <laughs> good thanks for that uh, for that answer so, uh, um there is a very interesting question can science communication be done without playing with words or being influence no there is always this uh it's about influencing people so um, what is a straightforward science communication and uh, uh yeah how this can be done without being too influential that's a very interesting point i think i'm not yeah well it really depends on what you actually want to achieve i mean it can be the goal of good science communication to change people's behavior that is a possibility as a goal and as long as i'm aware of that goal and i think a lot of climate scientists for example are currently trying to change the way individuals uh do things so so i don't think science communication is is has to not influence people i think science communication can influence people it just has to be honest about it in a way so we have to make our goals transparent and we have to say from which point of view we are communicating, from which standpoint we are communicating and what our goal is. And then it's fine to actually have a goal and try to influence people. So maybe, yeah, I think that would be my answer. Yeah. Good. Um, I think we have a very interesting question in the Indian context and also for structures and science communication, because we talked a bit who's the better science communicator, the researcher or the people employed for that job. And we, my understanding is in Germany, what I've seen in the last couple of years, that we have um, new positions upcoming in institutions um, where there are science communicators employed to take up the job as a full time job. So the question here is that communication isn't well paid in India and there's a lot of failure to get good talent into that field. So who should pay for science communication or should one pay for science communication? Should there be an investment and who should do this investment? The institutions, the researchers who want to publicize their work to get a better audience to be heard 
uh, so, uh, wo, um, how should the financial model for science communication look like also to guarantee this bit of independence and non-influential what we uh, just discussed before? Yeah, I think I think it has to come from the public sector in a way. I think it has to to be as free as possible. So there's a lot of philanthropic uh, foundations that support science communication. I think that's a good way of going. I think Wissenschaft im Dialog is financed in the greatest way possible by all of Germany's research organizations, which is brilliant because that means I don't have to do PR for one of them. I just do PR for all of them in a way by promoting science communication. I'm by promoting their researchers and their work. And I don't really have to say or draw those gloomy, glossy pictures, but I can actually go down to the honest part and think that is an almost ideal way. Um, it should never be the individual scientists and it should certainly, we should need to be very careful to keep independent from politics in a way, though that doesn't mean that a ministry of science and research can, should not fund science communication. I think they can because they are not as dependent on it just has to be done in the right way. But yeah, I think we need a multi-level funding system. There's no one way. Yeah, but I think the model of Wissenschaft im Dialog, where a lot of public institutions are, are funding in, so then it reduces also the particular interest of one institution having an influence. I think that's a Very great model to, to, yeah. to have one institution where a lot of uh, funding is feeded, uh, uh, feeded in. Um, we have a couple of questions regarding training for science communication, but before we come to that, I found it very uh, interesting at the end of your presentation, you were talking a lot about participative science communication, you know, and when we have to listen to our audience, we should engage them, and it's not about us sending the information, which we have done for, for decades now. Um, could you highlight a bit how one could do this? What would be formats uh, to achieve that tweak and to yeah to to engage and then to also get a better understanding uh, um, to reach out to these twenty percent you highlighted, which are believing not believing in science communication and science. So, are you trying at the moment at Wissenschaft im Dialog some models for that? Because I think that's a bit of a switch which we see at the moment, uh, at least in in in, in Germany. Yeah, very much so. And I think there's different levels of participation for different formats. There's different topics that can be addressed differently. So I think obviously the ultimate thing is to have uh, have people actually participate in science. So so citizen science can be a great way to get people engaged and to actually show people how science works. And I think I've pretty much made clear why we should do that. <laughs> so I don't need to do that again. Um, I think there's some, though, I think the citizen science thing is, it is difficult to set up and takes a bit of a time and process. And, but there are low entry participatory formats as well. So we, for example, we currently have a, um, a project called um, I'm a Scientist, which, uh, which was founded in the UK and we've transferred it to Germany where student, where school kids get to chat to scientists and can ask them any question they want on a certain topic. And they ask the greatest questions ever. They ask very specific questions about the, 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 the field the scientists are from, but they also ask them which computer games they play and they ask them why they love science and they share their worries and they share their yeah, they're scarce. And I think this is a very low barrier, high impact format where we see engagement um, about everything that belongs to science. And I think so this is one of the favorite things of my favorite things we're currently doing. Um, obviously, there's a million other projects that achieve similar things, but I think that is a way forward and we need to emphasize that more. Yeah. Yeah, let me challenge you a bit here. Yeah, so we, we had this uh, dialogue taking place in Germany, the Viscom factory, you know, where a lot of uh, experts in the field came together and that was, this was initiated by the Ministry of Education Research. Great process, a nice 120 pages paper out. How much the public participated in that process or was this more of an expert uh, discussion? Didn't we fail there? So I had the impression that it was an expert paper which came out. Yeah, it was very much an expert paper. I think it's still a huge achievement because it was experts from different areas of science communication. So we had researchers involved, we had science communication experts, we had science management experts involved. So 
So I think that was done very well and that was the purpose. It didn't integrate citizens. That was not what they were trying to do, I think. So yes, in a, yes, we left them out and that might be a flaw, but it wasn't something they just forgot. <laughs> I think it was purposefully set up in the way to be an expert paper. Okay, good. Great. So we have, uh, I think, a uh, um, nice question here from an aspiring PhD candidate who says, look, we are taught in our graduate schools here in India, uh, not just in India, also in Germany, to do scientific writing, to write good research purpose. What can we do on an individual level to become a better science communicator? Are there trainings available or what I am as a, as a PhD student could do if I would like to take up the topic and uh, to make my science better communicated? Yeah, I think there's a, I, I hope in India as well, um, <laughs> there are a million of science communication training programs by now. I think there's a lot happening in this area. Um, there are a lot of websites who provide information on science communication and as a researcher. I think a good, I think if as an individual you want to start communicating, it's always worthwhile looking at what other people do and trying to learn from them. So even if you don't have the opportunity for some reason to attend training sessions, and I think there's a claim that we should integrate them more and more. And I think we are seeing that development at the moment that there's more training opportunities. But even if you can't get to one of those for some reason, I think there's a benefit of looking at what others do and then finding your own way of communicating science. And it's very, there are some very simple questions that you can ask yourself, which are like, who am I and which role am I communicating from? What are my goals and what is my topic? Who do I want to reach? And then also, what are my strengths in communicating? Because if you don't like being in front of the camera, a YouTube channel will not be the right format for you. But you're certainly going to be able to tweet about your science. So I think finding low level ways of getting into science communication, which is probably easiest on social media because you can just start it on your own um, and I don't have to build a stage for a science slam, <laughs> is probably a good way to start. And But yeah, I, I would love to see more training opportunities arise. And I think I'm very hopeful that in that direction, we are seeing a lot of effort being made by many institutions. Yeah, and I think that's also in, in India the case. I just saw a couple of workshops being published, oh, and I think that's that, yeah. <laughs> um, I think we tackled that question already. So, the, given that model of the certain deficits, what, so what should policymakers do for science communication? So, if you would have a wish list to the German government or to the Indian government, what you would wish for? What would you wish for? What should they do to have a better science communication in place to catch these twenty percent of the people who are? Uh, uh, not believing in science, who are with the conspiracy theories. So if you would have a wish list, what, what should the government do? Um, support honest science communication and support structures that promote that as an intermediate. So I think those intermediate structures like Wissenschaft im Dialog or um, Science et Cité in Switzerland or, or something like that, that is a real, there's a real benefit. And I think that is worth spending money on. I think integrating SICOM trainings and SICOM efforts in funding models by the government is a very good thing. We are seeing that being developed in Germany at the moment that when you apply for government funding for your science, you always have to have a SICOM part and they are trying to make it so that it's not everyone writing, yes, we will create a web page. <laughs> so they are trying to actually create meaningful science communication programs and integrate them into the funding models. I think that's a good way going forward. And then another thing that I like to see is, um, is open discourse and ongoing discourse. I think we could benefit from talking to each other more and educating each other more about the viewpoints and the needs in regards to the job from both sides. And I think we need programs that help there. There's programs in, in Britain uh, where scientists go to parliament, for example, on a regular basis to have exchange and stuff like that we could really benefit from. And there, there the government can play a role, I think. It shouldn't play a role in funding all science communication because then it's not going to be independent anymore. 
that's uh, that's uh, that's true. Not not all institutes which are dependent uh, on on science communication. I think the intermediary uh, approach is very good. That leads us to the last question. I think that's that's very interesting. I think we can nicely connect it to the question had before. So now, if I as a government, as a public institution, would give funding to somebody, and we all have KPIs now in place, there is a lot of, uh, and you also talked about we have to prove and we have to get better insights about the results of our science communications. So are there already parameters in place, or are they currently developed? for determining what is a successful science communication. I would not say bad or good, as, as it was mentioned here in the chat, but what is uh, what is successful uh, um, science communication? And are there key indicators in, or key performance indicators in, in place? Because one has to prove, no, it's, it's daily work in a, in, a, in, a, in a way. Yeah, I think in, in Germany, there are guidelines for good science PR, which is institutional science communication. And those are, I mean, as a disclaimer and transparency disclaimer, Wissenschaft and Dialog has been part of developing them, so I like them. <laughs> um, but I think they are good because they are about a lot of about that is about transparency and about um, opening up about processes and making them visible to people. So I think there are certain guidelines. There are certainly similar guidelines across Europe. I think what we um, what we're currently seeing is that people are trying to get together to develop um, guidelines that are focused more on the researcher's perspective because that is the change in the system and we we haven't really seen that so yeah I think I think that needs to be changed and I think I'm seeing some efforts I haven't read any finished guidelines on that level yet but because obviously because it's not that easy to have guidelines but I think if you're asking what is good science communication, I think one of the key parameters is being common good orientated, being target group orientated and being transparent about uncertainties. And I think those three things are really, really important. Don't lie to people, basically. <laughs> Good. Uh, before we close the session, last question from my side. So we've talked about a lot of the about the German system. It was the focus of the Science Circle Lecture. We fed it a bit information on the Indian system. Well, yes, we have we looking at the moment a bit on an international level. And my feeling very often is that science communication is looked at a very national level at the moment. So is there a scope for international cooperation in that field, or is it so specific uh, that one should focus on? And there are so much difficulties and things we have to look um, at so that you should focus on the national. What would be your take on it? Um, I think we need both. I think there's, um, I mean, science is global. So why shouldn't science communication be global? Obviously, language is a parameter. So you can't only communicate science in Germany in English or and the same is very true, I believe, for India as well. So, so you need national efforts, but we can learn so much from our global experiences from different countries. And there are efforts made. I mean, there are international science communication conferences. There are um, there is EU action on European science communication. And so, yeah, definitely we need a, a global approach. It's not going to be. And I think that is true for a lot of things in science communication. It's not always going to be one way that is the right way. I think we need multiple ways to tackle problems and to, to tackle issues. But we should discuss them and we should learn from each other because there's no real benefit in every country inventing their own stuff and then never talking about the mistakes made in the past. So, yes, we do need more global exchange on it. And I don't think that at, at its core, science communication is different in different nations. I think there are certain things that are different, but the core thing principles remain the same. Yeah, I think uh, you highlighted there's uh, never one direction science communication because we talk about communication and communication is always multifaceted and there's not one 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 direction. So, uh, Rebecca, thanks so much for this wonderful presentation and the discussion. I found it very insightful. Thanks to the audience for the questions uh, who came in. We will provide the slides after afterwards to the participants. I would like to highlight to our audience that we are upcoming as DVH actually with a nice format of science communication, the Falling Walls Lab, where uh, entrepreneurs but also 
um, researchers can present their breakthrough ideas in a three minutes pitch in front of a jury. And uh, during that event, we also will host a workshop on storytelling, actually. So um, uh, have a look at this at our website. The call is still open. Wonderful format uh, to yeah, engage yourself. Uh, maybe the PhD candidate yet. Maybe you just give it a try. It's good to train yourself to participate in these things. So Falling Walls Lab is um, upcoming for us. Thanks, Rebecca, again for the a wonderful Thanks presentation for us. We will continue for sure the discussion to see where we can connect India and uh, Germany um, better. But uh, for the rest of the day, it remains for me to wish you a good rest of the day. Thank and uh, to our Indian audience, uh, a good good evening and uh, also good, uh, yeah, good evening here in, in India. Thank you so much and uh, take care and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thanks for the invite.